This week, we're exploring the stunning Creston Valley, where they're really making some great headway in food security initiatives. The Creston Valley stretches from the bottom of Kootenai Lake to the American border. Its wide, fertile floor and gentle climate make it ideal for growing a wide variety of produce, and farming is certainly an important part of the local economy. To learn more, I met with farmer Dave Much. So Dave, I've heard whisper of an organization called Fields Forward, which yeah, I believe um, you're a part of. The purpose of this is to uh, bring attention to agriculture and horticulture in the Creston Valley. We have all sorts of different agriculture. We have lots of vegetables, orchards, grains, dairies, cattle production. Right. And so the idea is to bring attention to each of those different sectors, but then to broaden it out as a whole. One of the concerns of Fields Forward is keeping farms as farms. There's all these people that want to be young farmers, but you, how do you buy someone's farm without that's any the trouble, capital, isn't it? right? Absolutely. So, then that's one of the working groups is to find place young people that want to be farmers with people that have land that don't oh, awesome. want to be farmers. So like it's trying to match meet up kind of yeah. Thing to try and get them to work together or to apprentice under or do a shadow program to right. make sure that it does continue. When Dave isn't organizing and educating, he's busy running his own farm business with partner Amy White. William Tell, Orchards and Cidery. We produce apples, pears, peaches, plums, apricots, some cherries, and we produce wine grapes as well. On how many acres? Just under eight acres. Wow. That's a lot of production on a pretty small parcel. Of it. It's intense. Most of the fruit they produce is processed and sold as juices. If we're processing it, it doesn't have to look perfect. Right. So we don't have to use as much sprays or chemicals in production, okay. which I don't enjoy spraying. And this gives us the opportunity to take that same fruit that went sell in the store and do something with it. Now we don't have to necessarily sell a bunch of fresh apples because there's so many produced just in the valley. Right. Right. and in the area. So that ugly fruit becomes viable then? It, it becomes uh, the basis for the uh, all the products. They now produce sparkling apple and pear juice, a range of cider vinegars, and recently they've started something new. We decided to, to try doing a, a drinking vinegar, otherwise known as a shrub. Yep. I've been really surprised on how popular they are yep. at the markets and just getting people to try them, and once they try it, it, it seems like they 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 want it, and so that's uh, it's exciting to know that new products are being accepted and people are are interested in trying different things with them. Before leaving, Dave opened a bottle of their sparkling apple juice for me to try. Oh, that's good. That's good. The the sweet and the sparkle just just married together so beautifully. The town of Creston has a population of just over 5,000 and a comfortable old-fashioned feel. The valley was settled by Europeans only 125 years ago, but has been home to the Kootenai First Nation for thousands of years. It enjoys a relatively mild climate with warm summers perfect for agriculture and grows a wide variety of fruit and vegetables including one of my summer favorites, tomatoes. Mm. So juicy. These tomatoes are one of the 1,500 varieties being kept alive by the Dan McMurray Seed Bank, a Fields Forward initiative. The goal is to actually have a sustainable living collection of seeds. So a lot of the times a seed bank is pictured as sort of a bunker where you save seeds and the big one is of, in Norway, yeah. they've got that gigantic. Exactly. Huge one, yeah. So in event of an like an apocalypse, we have an, a reserve. Whereas for us here, it's about having a collection of sort of different uh, varieties that you wouldn't normally have access to right. and anyone from the community can come in and um, ask us and we can distribute a variety and largely we do that either free or by donation. There are good reasons to keep those varieties going. They taste like tomatoes. Yeah. Go and, figure it. And so these ones have been eaten in Canada for over a hundred years which is mm -hmm. pretty for us a pretty special variety to keep in the bank. Right. So now I've I've eaten half of it or we've eaten half of it. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do if we want to save these seeds? Well, saving tomato seeds is pretty simple, but it does take a few steps. Okay. Uh, so what we do is we harvest the seeds from the tomato. 
just pop them out. It's always nice to make sure you actually label the variety that you're saving because right. if you mix that up later on, it may as Obviously well. Obviously, they all look yeah. pretty much the same, I guess, don't they? They're pretty yeah. close. So we've got our alacrity container here, and okay. what you want to do is add about an equal amount of water to okay. the juice that's already in there. Right. And then that just sits basically on your counter for probably about four or five days. Okay. You can actually put some saran over this if you find the smell gets a little offensive, or you can leave it uncovered. Okay. Because um, what you, but want you don't it want it to, to do, be sealed. No, you don't want to specifically seal it because okay. what's going to happen here is this is going to actually start to ferment right. and usually you'll get mold forming on the top. It's going to look a right mess, okay. but don't worry about that. You right. want it to happen. Okay. And sometimes they will smell bad. So just be, be prepared that right. could happen. That's okay. Um, so once that has got a nice uh, ferment going, yeah. the gel that coats the seed will start to break down. Okay. And once the seeds help, will settle to the bottom, you can scrape all of the mold off the top and then Usually, if you just have a strainer, you can dump it into your strainer. Oh, okay. Mix and rinse the seeds. Just a few sort of times. rub any residual off of there. Yep. And then those can just be dried off. And okay. you can just dry them off at room temperature. Usually, um, okay. it's nice to keep them on a, a, a surface that uh, they won't stick to once they've actually right. dried. Okay. So not a piece of paper towel is not a good idea. No. Okay. Um, but once that's uh, dried off, those are ready for storing, and you can uh, pack those seeds in a nice, cool, dark place, and should be good to go. Is it not just easier to go down to the, the garden center and buy a packet of tomato seeds? When you go down to the garden center and buy a packet of tomato seeds, your sele the varieties that you have to choose from, there's not really all that many. And actually, right. a lot of the ones that you pick from those um, from seed catalogs will be hybrid seed, oh, okay. which you're not actually able to save seed from. So it's not something that you can oh. um, sustain yourself, which is what one of the roles that the seed bank plays right. is we provide a source of seeds that people can then save themselves later as well. Food sustainability is certainly at the forefront in this area, and the Valley's residents are able to choose from a wide range of excellent local produce. But fortunately for us, some of their best local products have made it out of the Valley, including one of my personal favorites, Kootenai Alpine Cheese. The cheese is produced by the Harris family at Kootenai Meadows Farm, a fully organic dairy farm where I met up with Denise Harris. We milk about a hundred cows and we bottle milk twice, we process it, pasteurize and bottle it into glass bottles twice a week okay. and then three times a week we make cheese roughly and we grow all our own hay and grain as well. Okay, so you're trying to basically do everything under one roof Yes. kind of thing here yeah. on the farm. Yeah. Uh, so how many times a day are they milked? Twice. They milk twice a day and what would a an average cow produce for from milk? Probably about um, 24 four liters a day. Okay. So 12 okay. liters of milking. Okay. I think that sounds about and right. And that's quite, for, as I say, from what I know of the dairy, that's, that's pretty low comparatively speaking. That is it? low. But again, it's about quality, not quantity. And we have jerseys, a lot of jersey crosses in our herd. So that brings the, the liters down, but the butter fat is up. Right. Which of course makes excellent cheese. Yeah. The farm produces organic milk, butter, and beef for the local area. But the star of the show has to be their cheese which is now available from Calgary to Vancouver, though it is still all produced right here on the farm. So this is where all the magic happens? Apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a thousand liter vat. Wow, that would make a fantastic hot tub. <laughs> it's a hot water jacket, and the milk comes in from the milk line directly uh, under the sidewalk there, it comes gravity oh, it's fed. Oh, piped directly in, okay. And um, yeah, we attach the stir on stir, Okay. the milk, yeah. Uh, add the cultures and the rennet. Yeah. Once it's set, we'll cut it with this tool. This is an Italian spino. Okay. Um, then we start to stir it and cook it. And when you say cook, what would be a cooking temperature? 130. So oh, okay, so it's quite so about 55, yeah. 55 ish degrees yeah, sorry, centigrade. My, yeah. 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 Once it is cooked, the cheese is put into these forms and pressed. The next stage is two days in a salt brine bath which dries the surface to begin forming a rind. Then it is moved to the aging room. Oh, now we're talking. That smells just, oh, you can smell the cheese in the air. It's just so wonderful. It's a very earthy, kind of a ammonia -y smell. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love cheese. I have to confess it is, it is one of my weaknesses when it comes to food. In the aging room, the cheeses are turned regularly and rubbed. What is it you're rubbing them with? It's salt with a, with a culture in it, okay. and it develops just a nice rustic rind that really helps the flavor profile of the cheese. 
These cheeses will spend around 10 months in here before finally being ready to sell. So what have we got here? Okay, so I've got it lined up from youngest to oldest. Okay. So this is the Nostrella. So this one here is three months old. It's a little bit higher moisture than the Alpendine. Yep, you can tell it's, it's got yeah. some flexibility in there. <laughs> oh, that's delicious. And you know what, there's those tiny, tiny little nuggets just, of lactic just acid. Just starting in this Just one. beginning the, in there, it's so delicate. The you know Alpendine what? I see one. a souffle out of this. Okay. I think, I think I can safely say, we're gonna make a souffle with this one. Okay. Okay, so what else have we got? So then we've got the Alpendon. Okay, so, so this one's a little bit older. This is the one that's got the dark rind, so that's what the rind will look like at the end. Okay. It definitely has some crystals starting in it. Okay. I'm actually, I can't do this without tasting it myself. And why should you? <laughs> why should you be surrounded by all this beautiful cheese and not get to taste it? Quite so. delicious, quite delicious. And then this is the gran. It's probably easier just to eat a piece like here. So it's sim similar to this. It's very so, dry because it's this is two years old. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that on the microphone. The crunch of the crystals of those lactic acids. That is delicious. That's absolutely spectacular. And you know, I've said for many years, there's no Parmesan made in Canada, but that's getting pretty darn yeah. close. As we've seen, the Creston Valley is great for growing fruit, and like its neighbor to the west, the Okanagan, it's recently started to produce wine. There are now several wineries in the valley, and I'm visiting one of them, Bailey Groman, to find out more about this emerging wine-growing region. Bob Johnson bought the property, an abandoned apple orchard in 2006, and planted the first vines. Today, they produce around 5,000 cases a year. He's showing me around the 20-acre estate in style. I didn't know visiting vineyards could be this much fun. As he's one of the pioneer local winemakers, one of my first questions to Bob is what makes the Creston Valley a good area for growing grapes? We have uh, very specific micro uh, climate areas here in Creston. You can't just grow anywhere, but uh, in the middle of the valley, we get incredible sunshine hours, and it's a fantastic, cool climate grape growing area. We're growing grapes here similar to what you would in uh, Burgundy and, and oh, okay. Alsace. Yep. So, you know, we're growing uh, fantastic Pinot Noir. Right. Uh, that's one of our better, better wines that we have, and, and we do a great Chardonnay, uh, a Gewurztraminer, a Pinot Gris. We were called an emerging region. Uh, that has since uh, been recommended that we change to the Kootenai GI or the Kootenai Appellation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think uh, for us, it really means that we're starting to be recognized for the wines that we're making and that we are showing great wines. You know, we're winning golds here in Canada and recently also won a silver medal from the uh, Decanter Awards in London, England, oh, which wonderful. is really considered to be World Wine Awards. Right. So now that we're getting that kind of recognition, uh, it makes sense to come in and, and recognize the area as, as its own geographic area. Bob and co-owner Petra Fla bought in expert help to produce their wines, including an experienced winemaker from New Zealand. But being the first to develop a new region has its challenges and sometimes some surprises. We have huge flocks of crows that right. come in. At first we were very worried about what they were doing. We thought they were after grapes right. and, and, uh, and we watched them really closely. And in fact, what they were after is insects on the ground. Oh. So they're actually one of our uh, best friends, they're, they're eating insects out of the vineyard right. and really helping us and, and so we don't spray any pesticides at all. We let okay. all the bugs fight it out themselves right. along with the birds and, and the yeah. crows. Well, that's the first time I've ever been to the Kootenays and I have to say, what a place. So what I'm going to do today is an homage to Kootenay Alpine cheese and we're going to do a traditional classic cheese souffle. First thing we need for a cheese souffle is a little bit of bechamel. Now a bechamel is a white sauce which we make with butter to begin with 
into our pan. Over here I've got a little bit of milk that I've warmed up. Okay. Once the butter is melted, we're going to add an equal volume of flour. A roux is a equal volume of flour and fat. In this case I'm using butter. And this is used as a thickener for our milk. So once the butter's come up to temperature there, I'm going to add a few onions to this because we're going to do a cheese and onion souffle. And of course a little bit of garlic because cheese and garlic, they work so well together. We'll give it a little bit of little salt and a little bit of white pepper. It doesn't take too long, a couple of minutes on a saute just to get those onions nice and sweet. Okay, and then our flour, all purpose flour, sprinkle that over top and we're just going to stir this in and we're going to cook the starch and the flour out. Now if you can see in the pan there, the flour is just kind of sticking a little bit to the bottom of the pot and I just want that to cook through without coloring. So if you see any color, either take it off the heat or drop the heat because you don't want to have this brown at all. Okay, so there we go. I've got my flour cooked out and now I'm going to add about half of my milk and just stir that through until it's nice and smooth. We've got every little lump of flour worked out there. Once you've got the first addition of milk stirred in, then you can add the rest. And that should give you a nice smooth bechamel or white sauce. One last thing to go in there and I'm going to put this in at the end because mustard is affected quite dramatically by heat. So if you add this in and cook it out, you'll lose a lot of your flavor. So we put it in after it's off the heat, just about a teaspoon's worth and stir that through. Meanwhile, we've got our nice piece here of the Kootenai Alpine cheese. I'm going to get this grated, ready to incorporate. Okay. I have to admit, I am a cheese lover through and through. You can't put a cheese board in front of me and not expect it to be completely annihilated in a very short period of time. Okay, there we go. Okay, and then the next main component for souffles are eggs. So I've got three nice, fresh, free-range eggs. We need to separate these. Okay, I want the whites in a nice large bowl, very clean bowl. You do not want any fat in the bowl. If you have fat in the bowl, they will not whip up very well. The egg yolks we're going to hang on to over here. Okay, just separate the whites out, pouring them back and forth between the eggshells. At this point, we're going to take our bechamel. In go the egg yolks and just stir the egg yolks through that bechamel. And what's going to happen with these is that as it cooks, of course, the egg will coagulate and firm up and will give us a set that will hold our souffle up high without it collapsing. Then it's just about whisking our egg whites. So we want to bring our egg whites up to a nice stiff peak. Now if you can do, you could do this with an electric mixer, but if you've got a good action, and you notice I'm going under the egg whites, so that every time the whip goes through the egg whites, it's incorporating air. And in a very short space of time, you can whip your egg whites by hand without having to clean your electric mixer. If you feel particularly brave, there's one surefire way to confirm that your egg whites are properly whipped. They should be shiny and smooth. And they should also stick in the bowl. I'm glad they worked. Okay, so our bechamel has had a chance to cool down a little bit. Now it's about bringing everything together. I'm going to drop my cheese into the bechamel, which remember is still a little bit warm. Okay, and we want to keep a little bit of that cheese for topping. Just bring the two together. And then this goes into our egg whites. And then very carefully, fold the egg whites into the cheese sauce so that you maintain that air. Okay. 
Got my souffle dishes ready. And what I've done with these is I've just rubbed them with a little bit of butter, unsalted butter inside. That helps them slide up the sides of the souffle dish. And very gently we're going to put about three quarters in each one. You don't want to overfill them. You overfill them, you can get them pouring over the top. You want to have a little bit of gap at the top so that the souffle will rise up. Okay, and then just give them a little gentle tap down. And there's our cheese souffles ready to go in the oven. I've got my oven set for 375 degrees Fahrenheit, 190 degrees centigrade. And they're going to go in there for probably about 12 to 15 minutes until they're well inflated. Steve's not alone when it comes to liking cheese. It's one of my favorite things to eat. And actually, it's the simplicity of cheese that has sort of driven my pairing. I've chosen a mead. It's Tugwell Creek's Honey Mead, and it's the original Sin Sizer. This mead in particular has a brandied aspect to it. So think the traditional cheese board, a nice fortified wine or brandy. Uh, and this, that fruity aspect really plays off the richness of the cheese. Now for a beer, I've chosen the Powell Street Wit Beer. I've chosen this beer because of the style. The Wit Beer style means that there's a lot of suspended wheat within the beer, and it gives it a richness that I think can stand up to the cheese, but there's also a level of acidity to it that will cut through a lot of that fat. This beer is infused with ginger and cardamom. The ginger is subtle. It's, you're getting more of the spice from it. Uh, and the card cardamom is just giving it some really exotic, nice green notes, which I think will really compl complement this souffle.